The first sighting of Misty Willis happened exactly one year after her death, when a young couple, Melissa and Anthony, had met up in Melissa's cabin for an innocent night of board games. Board games? Or board games? Scrabble. And maybe some light making out. <laughs> Lame. Lame or not, Melissa and Anthony had a fierce competition going in the game. So much so that when Melissa laid down Jazzy on a triple word score, Anthony lost his cool for a moment and... Ah. Whack! He knocked the Scrabble board off Melissa's top bunk, sending tiles all over the floor like wooden raindrops. Melissa was disgusted. What is wrong with you? She yelled. I'm sorry, okay? Stop yelling. Anthony yelled back. Their argument was so loud that they almost didn't hear. <gasps> Misty! Misty's scream. It scared Melissa and Anthony so much that they ran right out of the cabin. Melissa made it all the way to her best friend's bunk, three cabins away, while Anthony made it back to his own bed. They never met up again. If their arguments were strong enough to wake the dead, it obviously wasn't meant to be. And... And what? Melissa got another sign. The next morning, when she made it back to her cabin, the Scrabble board was back in place on her bed, neatly arranged, and completed as though the entire game had been played. Four words stuck out, laid in order across the center of the board. Stay away from him. <gasps> no way. Way. And bedtime! Ugh. Come on, guys. You know it's a long initiation night ahead. This isn't your first rodeo. Sorry, Sadie. I know it'll be tough for you to miss it. Yeah, it sucks. June, don't you think you could talk to Miss McKenzie? It's one of our last summers as campers, and- Sorry, guys. Rules are rules, and Sadie broke a pretty big one. It's only one week of suspension. You'll survive. Get some rest. Margo, I'm sorry. I know you've been working really hard on this with all the crafts and stuff. I, I should have known better. It's okay. We'll just miss you. This is The Crime at Camp Ashwood. Episode 3, Initiation. Friday, the freaking 13th of June... 2003. You know, sometimes I think I'll run for office one day. Or if not office, maybe like PTA president. Is that a thing? Anyway, a place where I can make speeches and put this slightly overbearing extroverted personality to good use. Mama says I've been a professional debater since I was six years old, convincing her that I couldn't possibly choose just one toy from the aisles of Kmart. I always left with two, minimum. I guess this journal is as good a place as any to craft a thoughtful, political response to the questions my hypothetical future campaigns might get about the time I was caught skinny dipping with the boys from Camp Rockland and subsequently was banned from attending all the fun parts of Ashwood for a whole dang week. <laughs> Plus, I'm sure you'd like to read an explanation in this journal right now, Margo, since I know you're pretty upset with me, even though you said it was okay, that I wouldn't be able to help out or be a part of initiation tonight. Anyway, on to my statement. I guess first, I'd say that initiation night is easily the best night of camp if it's your first year at Ashwood. Mostly because you have no idea what's coming and who doesn't love a surprise? At camp, there are three clubs, Eagles, Cardinals, and Hummingbirds. Every camper has a club selected for them by the staff their first summer here, and then they stay in that club for the rest of their time at Ashwood. Initiation night is where you find out your placement, and it is a memorable experience, to say the least. The night Margot, Veronica, and I were made eagles is a core memory, with a capital C. <gasps> Margot Ingle, Sadie Cameron, and Veronica Hughes, you have been summoned for a special event. Do you trust us? Trust? Yes, we do. We trust you. Then I need you to put these blindfolds on and take my hand. 
will lead you to the secret location where all will be revealed. The snatch you in the night tradition led to what felt like a long walk in the dark, blindfolded and trying desperately not to trip over any fallen tree branches, until you reached a giant bonfire built at a clearing in the camp's woods. There you'd be unblindfolded to reveal that the entire camp was there too. Each new camper would be brought up to the fire individually to have their club assignment announced. When that announcement came, everyone in that club, eagle, cardinal, or hummingbird, would come up rushing over the new camper and hug them, lift them in the air, and chant one of their signature songs. Eagles fly, eagles fly to the highest. Don't you dare anywhere try to deny us. Anyways, the whole thing was like a sorority rush, except that the average age of those being initiated was 10 or 11 years old. It was the coolest freaking thing you could imagine, honestly. If you hadn't been all that into the idea of becoming an Ashwood camper, initiation was what sold you. On initiation night after your first year, the evening is spent trying to recreate the feeling you had once upon a time for new campers. And I've always had fun doing it. You know, making the sparkly bandana blindfolds and welcome cards. Seeing the look of shock and excitement on the new girls' faces, it's awesome. But I guess it also always makes me a little sad, too. Maybe it's childish of me, but I always wish that I was still one of the new kids that night. The ones getting the rush who, who don't know what's coming. I think it's probably how parents feel about Christmas. Said enough for Santa can't possibly be as fun as believing in him, right? This year, I suppose I ended up choosing to have some excitement of my own instead. When I snuck out with Paul, JJ, and their cabin mates over at Rockland, the idea was just to go swimming. And it was a blast. Until one of the guys said some real dumb dickhead thing about me to Paul, and he lost it. I told him to just let it go. But getting a 17-year-old boy to calm down about anything is ugh, impossible. So I let him convince me to sneak out even further down the lake to his parents' backyard. We got caught, of course, but it was 1,000% worth it. And I think anyone who has ever believed in romance would agree. Paul got a bottle of wine from his dad's collection, the good stuff, and then we drank it under an old oak tree. He carved our initials into the trunk with the wine key. It took forever, but I couldn't stop smiling. Even when Mr. and Mrs. Mackenzie showed up at Paul's dock with a flashlight and a full playbook of consequences, I still couldn't stop smiling. <laughs> I had a grin on my face the whole boat ride back to Ashwood. He put our initials on a tree that's older than either of our parents. A tree that'll probably outlive us, too. I've just never had anybody make something forever like that. Now, I don't know if it was that Paul did a better job at pretending to be remorseful while I couldn't stop smiling like a dog with a bone, or if it was just straight up double standards, but he got off with a little bit of extra dining hall cleanup and I got a week's worth of camp detention. No club parties, no free swim hour, and definitely no initiation night. It sucks but I still solemnly swear that it was worth it. I had been so angry with Sadie about missing that initiation night that I never even read this entry in the journal until now. It wasn't just that I had made a deal with her to help me with the setup or that it was one of our most important traditions together. It was that she'd thrown it all in the trash for Paul, of all people. I know that years of seeing him as the person of interest behind her death would have created a bias in anyone, but I never liked the guy, even when we were teenagers. He was tall, wealthy from some inheritance on his mom's side, the dude that all the girls fawned over, and he knew it. The knowing it was my issue, the way he smugly smiled at Sadie when she gave him moon eyes, like he was owed someone as awesome as her. It made my blood boil. That I think an entire system banded together to make sure he'd never even be considered as a real suspect made it boil even more. He knew he could do anything. And he was right. Ugh. This thing about the tree carving is rich. I bet they cut it down after she died. Erased any trace. You know what? I'd love to know if they did cut it down. And I can know. What's the point of being here in Asheville if I'm not going to go see all of this with my own damn eyes?
20 years has passed and I couldn't tell you what I had for breakfast this morning. But I still know this lake by heart. The Ashwood Dance Hall on the south end by the beach. Sadie's parents' house on the far east side, just beyond the public docks. Veronica's dad's place, smaller and to the north. And Paul's family estate, with a lawn landscaped to the nines on the west, where the houses were ironically surrounded by gates in the front and open water in the back. Camp Ashwood was about 60% local Asheville kids. Their families were peppered throughout the city, but if you lived on the lake, it was the standard that you sent your kids to camp. They could swim home, after all. And many of them did. Sneaking out was frowned upon, and sneaking out at night with your boyfriend was definitely cause for punishment. But it was mostly accepted that the kids from the lake were going to break the rules and grab snacks or clean clothes from their mom and dad during the week. Blind eyes got turned. Heck, the reason that I know the canoe route so well is that I snuck to Sadie's or Veronica's on multiple occasions. It's weird to be back, though. Like, no time has passed at all. But also like it's been forever. <laughs> Margo, faster! You've got to keep pace or we're going to go in circles. Is this even a good idea? It's a great idea, if we don't get caught. Says the president of the camp breakfast club. You've already missed the whole week of stuff. Can't you just wait one more day so you don't add another? I told you. If it wasn't important, I wouldn't have done it. What did you even get in there? And please tell me your mom left some cookies out or something. I should at least get something out of this. Oh, there's cookies. And something special I needed for Paul. What does Paul need that he can't get himself? Can you please just focus on the cookies, Margo? They're chocolate chocolate chip. With sea salt. Extra chips? The extra -ist. You do know the way to my heart. And what if I told you that I came up with a way to make up for missing initiation? I would say that sounds intriguing. I enlisted Veronica to help me and stole you away for this little canoe trip so she'd have time to set up. So, prepare to be wowed in a way that makes you so blissfully happy to be my bestie that you totally forget how annoyed you've been with me all week. No, I haven't been- You have. No, I- Margo, it's okay. I know that you think I'm choosing some guy over you, and I'm I'm sorry that it's hurt your feelings. I didn't want that. Paul's just been there for me. He lives here year-round. We're close. But you have to know, you're the love of my life. No guy is ever going to be more important than you are to me. I guess I just feel like summers seem shorter now that we're older. This is the only time I see you. Paul and everyone else gets you all year. You're right. And I'm going to do whatever I can to make the most of the rest of the time we have. Starting with a spa night made up of all those face creams I just stole from my mom's bathroom and Veronica's DIY mud masks. Like, real mud? Yeah, Cosmo says it's good for you. We're going to scare the crap out of June tonight if she comes in and we have that all over our faces. And that's an added bonus. <laughs> <laughs> For all the sneaky trips we took to Camper's parents' places, I've never been to Paul's until now. He'd never invited me, and I'd never had any desire to come. It was too fancy for me here. The manicured lawn, the weird statues they'd imported from Italy that loomed over the back patio like watchdogs. The statues are the only ones watching tonight, though. Paul's parents are in the Outer Banks on an annual vacation. I know this because Instagram told me. It's amazing how easily we can track people now. If we'd had social media back in 2003, I probably already would have seen this tree carving Sadie wrote so blissfully about in some post with a heart emoji and a caption about how perfect everything was between she and Paul. <gasps> of course, I'm sure I wouldn't have seen what I'm seeing now in that post. Because the tree in front of me is still standing. But Sadie's name is crossed out deep cuts that had to be made by a knife, much deeper than the original wine key carvings. It looks like someone's come back here over and over again to cross out her name. 
like they've enjoyed it. Erasing her. What the fuck am I even doing here? It's not like I don't think anyone at the police station has seen this before. But they haven't seen it from me yet. Not with the tears in my eyes or the anger I'm sure will be in my voice when I show up there in an hour. And I'm done letting them get away with having this case fade from memory without a fight. It's about fucking time someone forced them to look at who Paul really is. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Crime at Camp Ashwood. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. If you'd like to support this podcast so we can keep making more episodes, click the support link in the show notes. To learn more about this and all our projects, visit our production company websites, dragonhunterproductions.com and newgirlpictures.com. Thank you for listening.